We're covering everything that you need to know about experience. People applying for new positions, it's like the cherry on top. With the technology to attract talent. Recruiters always know their best talent. The AI just wants to use that information. Inclusion efforts across the organization. Tell me what it's like to work for through the associate story. Interviews with leaders in the industry. Talk about what's new in HR tech. What are the hot topics? We're here every week, folks. Weekly look at the latest and greatest topics in HR. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Talent Experience Live. This is, as I like to say, the greatest show on the internet. I know it's a bold statement, but I'm going to keep making it every week. This is the place to be every Thursday if you're a recruiter, a sourcer, a talent marketer, or a talent manager. We're covering all things talent experience. I'm your host, Tom Tate. I'm on the marketing team here at Phenom. And if you're just joining us, we go live every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern time on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. Be sure to follow us on any of those channels, your platform of choice, uh, like, subscribe. If you're on YouTube, click the little bell to get notified so that you never miss a beat. We love being here every week and uh, we hope that you do too. Uh, I am super sick with the cold today. I, I, I have the sniffles, I'm not gonna lie, um, but the show must go on. So for today, in honor of International Women's Day, which was just this past Tuesday, uh, we wanted to take this time to replay one of our most popular episodes. Uh, this episode was one of our highest rated. Uh, it has some of the most views in our archive. Um, it had great engagement throughout the episode. Uh, and it was just one of my favorite conversations. So this is coming to us from last August of 2021. Uh, the episode is Breaking Barriers, Empowering the Next Generation of Women Leaders. And our guest for this episode was Colleen Stratton. She's the Global Leader of Workforce Development at a company called SEI. Uh, SEI is awesome, uh, super local to me uh, here out in Eastern Pennsylvania. And uh, this is a very fitting episode as the theme for this year's International Women's Day is Break the Bias, uh, such an awesome theme. And in this episode, uh, Colleen is gonna share more about her commitment to turning women into leaders, how she's leveraging data specifically to strengthen her strategies that they're working on at SEI. Uh, the key differences between mentorship and sponsorship, that was an incredible revelation for me uh, as I encountered in this episode uh, and really going deeper into a lot of the programs that they're experimenting with, uh, which is really awesome. So enjoy this replay of, of one of my favorite TXL conversations. Uh, I'll be in, in back here. I got my green juice. I'll be sipping on my green juice, uh, practicing a little self-care. So uh, we'll be back next week. We have a great episode next week. Uh, Adam Thompson from Phenom. We're going to be talking all about high volume hiring. Uh, but until then, enjoy this replay of uh, such an amazing episode with Colleen. And uh, we will be back soon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. In, in the words of Devin Foster, the host of Town Experience Live, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, this is Town Experience Live. This is your weekly look the latest and the greatest topics in HR. We cover all different types of topics. We talk with leaders in the industry and we really like to dive into what's new in HR and HR tech. My name is Tom Tates. I'm not Devin Foster. I'm filling in for Devin. Um, Devin is actually out on paternity leave. So I wanna give a warm welcome and uh, to his beautiful daughter and congratulations to him and his family. Uh, we got some pictures uh, sent over to us in Slack this week and it's super exciting. So when he returns with us in a couple weeks uh, to the show, uh, be sure to give him a congratulations as well. Um, every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern, uh, we go live. We go live on LinkedIn, we go live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And we're just covering all things talent experience. It is super exciting. I'm very excited to be here. Recruitment, talent acquisition, talent management, the whole nine. Uh, so I just want to welcome you to the show. If you're new to Talent Experience Live, you can check out our archive over at phenom.com. Over on the blog, we have all of our previous episodes as individual posts. And the cool thing about that is we split them up into little segments. So you can just watch the highlights if you want, leave the transcripts. Uh, so definitely check that out. We have all different uh amazing guests that have joined us in the past so check out the archive um today so today we have a really amazing guest and i just have to preface this by saying uh today's women equality day and i i promise you we did not plan it we did not plan this right um 
we have Colleen Stratton with us. She's the global leader of workforce development at SEI. Uh, and Colleen is going to share how SEI is not only retaining women, but developing them for leadership roles by fine tuning and valuable skills. We're going to dive into some of those skills, mentorship, sponsorship, delegation, negotiation. And they have a lot of amazing programs that are happening. Um, and it just so happens to be that, that today is Women Equality Day. Uh, so again, we did not plan this. So before Colleen joins us in just a few minutes to share a ton of insight, um, I love to have people sound off in the comments, right? So if you're joining us, I always like to say I work for the internet because uh, I get to engage with people from all across the globe. Uh, so I'm on the East Coast. I'm in Eastern Pennsylvania, um, just outside of Philadelphia. But chime in in the comments. I'd love to hear who you are, where you're tuning in from. Uh, I get to interact with people globally, and that's amazing, right? This is an amazing world we live in. So uh, chime in. Let us know who you are, where you're tuning in from. And uh, if you are a uh, longtime viewer of Town Experience Live, you know we always like to start off with an icebreaker question. And I think in honor of women, uh, in honor of Women Equality Day, uh, I'd love to just give a shout out to the most influential woman in your career. You know you have it, right? You know you have that at, at uh, top of mind. So think about uh, the most influential woman in your career and and give that person a quick shout out. So uh, the most influential woman in my career happens to be my first uh, my first boss right out of college. Uh, her name is Tanya Penn Harper, um, and I still keep in touch with her. This is a very long time ago. Um, I came out of college right after uh, uh, the financial crisis, so it wasn't uh, the best time to be looking for work, uh, but I was super blessed uh, to end up working for such an amazing uh, female leader. And she taught me so much about the industry I was working in, but she taught me uh, so much about integrity. Uh, that's like the one takeaway. Uh, she passed on so many amazing lessons about how to maintain integrity in, in business uh, and uh, throughout your professional career. Um, so we have a bunch of awesome people tuning in today. Uh, Valley Forge PA, Oaks PA, Winwood PA, uh, Lauren tuning in from South Philly, welcome. Uh, London in the UK, welcome. Uh, so we have some international presence here, not just uh, East Coasters here in the United States. Uh, happy to see all of you tuning in today. Um, so again, give a quick shout out, uh, shout out in the chat if you have uh, an influential woman in your professional career, professional development. Uh, love to hear it. Jen chimes in. Maria Wolf, amazing editor. Love to hear it. Um, uh, we have most influential woman in my career, uh, Colleen Stratton uh, and uh, Lynn. So well, awesome. Awesome. Love to hear it. Cool. Well, we're going to get right into today's topic. Um, continue to sound off in the comments, ask questions. Uh, this is meant to be engage, uh, engaging and interactive. Um, so this is live. Let's definitely uh, enjoy that aspect of it. Um, if you're not able to catch the full episode, if you have to bounce, you can always come back and check out the replay. We'd love to hear uh, your thoughts. And our blog post, again, will have the full recap. So without any further ado, uh, let's bring Colleen on. And uh, we'll talk about our topic today, Breaking Barriers, Empowering the Next Generation of Women Leaders. Hey, Colleen, welcome to today's show. Hey, Tom, what an honor to be talking about this topic today of all days, National Equality Day. So thank you for having me. I know it, it is uh, quite the coincidence, um, but we are super excited to have you join us today. And, you know, when we're talking to HR leaders, uh, my colleague, Devin, who typically hosts the show, he always likes to say, you know, very few people wake up, uh, you know, when they're kids and say, hey, you know, I want to get into HR. You know, it's my, my dream. I want to be an uh, uh, HR professional growing up. Everyone seems to have a very unique journey getting into HR, right, and getting into these types of positions. And I'd love to kind of hear just a quick, uh, quick rundown of what, what has been your professional journey in the HR space. Uh, and if, if you want to kind of get into how you became such an advocate for advancing women's careers, like, What's your origin story? Sure. So I've actually titled that chapter of my life. That chapter of my life is called Thank You, Dr. Chase. Uh, 
So let me say, I started working unofficially when I was 11, but earning money through a paycheck since I was 13. I've always loved to work. And I worked my way through college as an undergraduate. I was a waitress in Washington, D.C. at a bar called Rumors. And I had a regular customer, and his name was Dr. Kenneth Chase. And he uh, was the president and CEO of a group of occupational health associates in the D.C. area. And back then, I thought I wanted to be a CPA, an accountant, or potentially a consultant for a big six accounting firm. And I was a finance business major working to get my MBA in finance. And Dr. Chase said, hey, I'll hire you. Come work for me. You can be a staff accountant in my accounting department. And I thank God for him all the time because I learned very quickly that I did not want to be an accountant when I didn't have sure. enough uh, interpersonal action with other people in the office. He also did something else, Tom, that I, I always uh, credit him for, which really influenced my life. So I started working for him. And remember, this is 1988. I'm showing my age at this. But he hired me at $16 an hour. And two weeks into working for him, and remember, I didn't like the job, but I was, I was doing it. He brought me into his office and he said, you know what? You're performing at a level that we really didn't expect. So we're bumping your hourly rate up to $18 an hour. Wow. And that was huge for someone who was 20 years old at the time. And, you know, I learned so many valuable lessons from that. One is that even if you don't like the work that you're doing, you can make the most out of it. You can do a good job at it and you can learn something from that experience and it can really benefit you. And I loved that office and that company. I just didn't like the technical piece of the job that I was doing. But I don't mind being technical. So for me, I also learned that I probably wanted to work in an industry that was either in finance or technology, but I wanted to be dealing with people on a daily basis, which is really how I came about being in HR, because I have the best of both worlds. I'm an HR professional, but I've worked in technology and finance, and now I work in the fintech industry, which is really awesome because I get to um, you know, play up to many of my strengths that I wouldn't get to use in another company. I think, you know, that example of Dr. Chase is one of the many ways that I've been incredibly lucky in my life. I've had amazing mentors and sponsors, which I know we'll talk about later. Sure. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, they have really um, helped me and propelled me in my career. And so that led me to say, I want to help other women in their career. And then, of course, I have two daughters and they are 18 and uh, 20, soon to be 21. And they're incredibly wonderful, mature, powerful women that I look forward to watching succeed in life. And so I've become very passionate about the topic because I really think that we can help each other and that I've had not enough women mentors and sponsors in my life. In fact, most of my female mentors and sponsors have happened in the last five to 10 years, not in the first 20 to 30 years of my career. And so I, I've really put it back on myself to take responsibility for being mentors and sponsors to other women in the workforce because there just aren't enough of us. Yeah, no, that that's that's amazing and super inspiring. I I have two daughters as well. They're a little younger, uh, six and four, but you know, I, I've had my eyes wide open. You know, it, it's all about how can I help instill the same values and confidence, right? And and have them have the same understanding of, of uh, being able to look for open doors and open doors themselves and understand that there's so much opportunity out there. So uh, I really appreciate the opportunity, my opportunity to uh, engage with you and, and learn from you, right? Because I get to take all of this and apply it on my personal level, on a personal level as well. Um, you mentioned fintech and you mentioned being able to uh, get into that that industry and that sector and continue to uh, engage with what interests you and, and work with people. Uh, for a lot of our viewers, they may not know SEI. Uh, they may not know what SEI uh, does. Uh, do you want to give us a quick uh, rundown of kind of who SEI is and, and, and what you do? Sure. Yeah, we're a 53-year-old company located in the Collegeville Oaks area. We have about 4,000 employees, a workforce of about 6,000. We really do um, asset management, investment processing, and technology. So a good mix of all of that in our business. And we are worldwide. Um, you saw Shivani was, was one of our ex-employees in the London office, who's a great friend of mine. But we've, uh, we've got employees in London. We've got employees in Dublin, in Canada. Uh, predominantly in the U.S., so most of our employee base is sure. located in the U.S. That's awesome. And, you know, we talked a little bit offline, so I'm already familiar with some of the amazing programs that you're instilling and, and you're kind of spearheading at SEI. And uh, I'm excited to dive into some of those unique programs uh, that are specifically guided to help move women's careers forward. 
Um, at a high level, though, just before we get into the specifics, what are some of the top challenges that you've discovered uh, that, that you see women facing today? And how has that guided your direction in developing some of these programs? So let me start with another story. So sure. I'm, I don't know if it's 2017 or 2018, but I was in the UK on a trip in our London office. And I, one of the things that um, people that know me know that I absolutely am addicted to the BBC in the morning. I love to wake up early and watch a good hour of the BBC. And I'm watching the BBC and it was the day that the uh, news published the salary differential between the male anchors and the female anchors in the London market. And in the middle of the broadcast, the woman anchor walked off the stage and never came back. And I remember thinking at the time, uh oh, you know, sometimes you have those uh oh moments where you're like, we really need to do something about this. And that um, coupled with the Me Too movement in the US really led me to be like, we need to put a concerted effort into making sure that we're looking at women across the organization and that we have women in the positions we want them in and that we're hiring women at the levels that we really want to hire them at. So, you know, really the first thing that we did was we said we need to know what we're looking at as an organization. And we put together a dashboard that we could use to really see where we were. And so, of course, we looked at the first thing, which is how many women do we have at different levels? We broke our levels into five levels. Originally, we had more than five, but we did not you know, we're a fairly flat organization. We do have some hierarchy, but not as much as other companies of our size. And so we found it uh, better for us to group our director and vice president levels together. So we created five levels and we looked at what percentage of women do we have in those positions? What percentage of women are promoted within the organization up into those positions? What percentage of external hires are women that we're putting into those different levels of that position? And what is our turnover rate at each of those levels of women within the organization? And that was incredibly insightful to me. And I've been looking at this data since 2017 and the trends of it, and we've put out there um, efforts that we want to undertake as an organization. And that has really improved those numbers over time. Now, COVID was an exceptional year, the year of COVID. But you know, sure. in general, we've really made some efforts there. And one of the things that was really important that I think we did was uh, we recognized how powerful the SEI Women's Network is within the organization. But we also saw a need to really supplement that with some very senior women. And I always use the term, it takes a village in this case, but we put together the five most senior women in the organization and we created a campaign that we call the Get, Grow, Keep campaign. And that campaign was really about putting, um, looking at the data, making sure we understood what it was telling us and then putting into place some efforts that we may be able to make as an organization and making sure that we are making those efforts and reporting back on them. So really in conjunction with the SEI Women's Network, we put a, a significant focus on advancing women within the organization since 2018. So I have, I have a couple of questions. One, you know, just a quick observation. One of my favorite quotes of all time is uh, you can't manage what you can't measure, right? And you certainly can't improve what you can't measure. You have to know. So I uh, love that you've taken kind of that data-driven, data-first approach of really letting the data give you the understanding of kind of where you were at that time. Um, did you have any access to legacy data before 2017 or was it just you know, you realized that this was an initiative you were going to spearhead and you just had to start collecting the data at that time, or was there anything available to you? I'm thinking about organizations that aren't doing this level of kind of data mining. Uh, where do you begin uh, at that at that level? Well, we're lucky enough to have an HRIS system, right? Sure. So we have a current we use Workday currently um, as our HRIS system. So yes, we do have some historical data that we're able to look at not as intensely as the dashboard that we've created. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a proud Phenom customer. I will say that, right? So we've been uh, modernizing our HR technology for about five years as an organization. And part of that has really been um, to be able to use data to make better business decisions. And so we're at the point now where we're able to report on the data, but we're starting to move into what's really exciting for us, which is the ability to predict. So I would say even if you haven't started, you can start now tracking. You can start looking at it. I see incredible things when I look at the data. And I, I Tom, I gave you this example in one of our other conversations, but I'll give it to you now. One of the things when I just looked at straight 
turnover data, not even for women, but turnover for the company overall, we really saw an inflection. Welcome, welcome, welcome. For us to group our director and vice president levels together. So we created five levels and we looked at what percentage of women do we have in those positions? What percentage of women are promoted within the organization up into those positions? What percentage of external hires are women that we're putting into those different levels of that position? And what is our turnover rate at each of those levels of women within the organization? And that was incredibly insightful to me. And I've been looking at this data since 2017 and the trends of it, and we've put out there um, efforts that we wanna undertake as an organization. And that has really improved those numbers over time. Now, COVID was an exceptional year, the year of COVID, but you know, sure. in general, we've really made some efforts there. And one of the things that was really important that I think we did was uh, we recognized how powerful the SEI Women's Network is within the organization. But we also saw a need to really supplement that with some very senior women, and I always, use the term, it takes a village in this case, but we put together the five most senior women in the organization and we created a campaign that we call the Get, Grow, Keep campaign. And that campaign was really about putting, um, looking at the data, making sure we understood what it was telling us and then putting into place some efforts that we may be able to make as an organization and making sure that we are making those efforts and reporting back on them. So really in conjunction with the SEI Women's Network, we put a, a significant focus on advancing women within the organization since 2018. So I have, I have a couple of questions. One, you know, just a quick observation. One of my favorite quotes of all time is uh, you can't manage what you can't measure, right? And you certainly can't improve what you can't measure. You have to know. So I uh, love that you've taken kind of that data-driven, data-first approach of really letting the data give you the understanding of kind of where you were at that time. Um, did you have any access to legacy data before 2017 or was it just you know, you realized that this was an initiative you were going to spearhead and you just had to start collecting the data at that time? Or was there anything available to you? I'm thinking about organizations that aren't doing this level of kind of data mining. Uh, where do you begin uh, at that at that level? Well, we're lucky enough to have an HRIS system, right? Sure. So we have a current, we use Workday currently um, as our HRIS system. So yes, we do have some historical data that we're able to look at not as intensely as the dashboard that we've created. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a proud Phenom customer. I will say that, right? So we've been uh, modernizing our HR technology for about five years as an organization. And part of that has really been um, to be able to use data to make better business decisions. And so we're at the point now where we're able to report on the data, but we're starting to move into what's really exciting for us, which is the ability to predict. 
So I would say even if you haven't started, you can start now tracking. You can start looking at it. I see incredible things when I look at the data. And I, I, Tom, I gave you this example in one of our other conversations, but I'll give it to you now. One of the things when I just looked at straight turnover data, not even for women, but turnover for the company overall, we really saw an inflection point at year five. So we could see that if we got you beyond year five as an organization and into year six, you were much more likely to be here at year 10. And you were also much more highly skilled and valuable to the organization the more tenured you are when you stayed here. So looking at that data, we can say that if that's a pivotal year, is there a way that we can focus resources on the years when we know it's really going to count for some of our employees? And that includes women. And you know, the, the evolution of this for me today is that we're really evolving that into the DNI space as well and doing the same level of reporting that we've been doing on women for all of our diversity recruiting as an organization and making sure that we're looking at that data and seeing what is it telling us and, and what can we learn from it. And we didn't just look at the numbers, we also surveyed and sure. then we did some follow-up focus groups. And what was really cool about the first focus groups that we did as part of the Get, Grow, Keep campaign is that one of the suggestions from the focus group was that they wanted to see if there was any deviation if we did the same focus group for men. So we did have an all-male focus group that we uh, also presented the same data to and got their feedback on. So I'm, you know, with COVID, we did probably not as much surveying as I typically like to do. And so we have plans to restart to do some of that to make sure that we're, that, you know, so many things have shifted with COVID. We want to make sure that we're directionally correct in what we're trying to achieve with all of these initiatives. So I think it's time for us to relook at that and make sure that we get feedback. Um, we've always been an organization that's that's um, taken a lot of pride in listening to our employees. So we wanna make sure that we're giving them avenues to tell us what they think and that that can influence the decisions that we're making. Yeah, I, I love all that. And I think it's such a um, such a mature way to do it, right? Uh, again, not make any assumptions uh, or uh, let any of your um, inherent biases kind of color what you think should be the strategy, like really getting into the data, but then also layering on uh, the voice of the employee, you know, through kind of the uh, uh, ability to survey and kind of have these focus groups and panels. Um, in addition to the Get Grow Keep campaign that you ran, uh, are there any other specific initiatives that you want to touch on real quick? Because we can use those kind of to, to as a jump off point to talk about some of the, the finer details. Yeah, I'd like to talk about one other one that we're currently doing and then something that has me really excited in the future sure. that we're doing as an organization. So um, we it's a funny name, a program that we have at SEI, but it's called the 5 to 15 program. And it's not that you have 5 to 15 years tenure at the organization, but it's that you're ready for a very senior position in 5 to 15 years and we really put together a leadership development program. I'm very proud of the statistics of that. Um, we are at least 40% female in all of the classes that we've had with that program, which is awesome to see. And it's um, about developing the skills that you need to be successful at the next level. One of the things that we do, because people always ask me this, that really works well at SEI is we assign those groups participating in the program projects, strategic level projects that are sponsored by one of our executives. We call our executives EPS, but sponsored by EPS. And it really lets um, people get exposure across the organization. And if I look back at the first um, cohort of this class, I think it's it's either 30 or 40% of that cohort have already advanced in their career, either within their current job, been promoted to a new level or moved around the organization. So that's one of the things we look at to see if that is successful. That is for both men and women. But something that's really exciting that the SEI Women's Network is doing uh, moving ahead is, is looking at that we are launching a women's development series cohort that just started. So if you interview me in a year, I will sure. hopefully have some great feedback on that program and how successful it was within the organization. But that was that program is designed to focus on some of the skills that you mentioned out at the beginning of the um, presentation, right? So negotiation skills, um, speaking up, those types of skills are being focused on through that cohort. And we hope to continue that on. Again, this is the pilot, so I can't speak too much to it, but I'm sure. really excited yeah. about it. I think it's a great program. And I'm very proud of the women in the SCI Women's Network who came forward with that. That's awesome. And, and honestly, come back, right? Come back after you have kind of the, the stories to tell and uh, kind of an understanding of how that, how that went for you and your network. We'd love to kind of hear and regroup on that and do a follow-up. So uh, open invitation anytime you can come back on the show and we'd love to cover that. Um, 
let's dive into a couple of those different skills and those different elements of those programs. Um, one of the conversations that you and I had uh, with, with our colleague Jen a couple of days ago, kind of in preparation for this, was something I've honestly never thought about before, which was the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Um, and I think that we so frequently conflate the two. Um, so I'd love to kind of hear your take on uh, how valuable is mentorship and how valuable is sponsorship as two separate things that we need to be focused on, you know, when we're looking at creating opportunities uh, for employee development. Sure. And I'm a fan of both. I have Absolutely. both in my life, yeah. right? So they're both really important. So we learned this through um, our focus groups after we did the survey. Um, it, it, our employees would always say we want a mentorship program, but when we, we scratched at that a little bit, it wasn't really mentorship that they were looking at, it was sponsorship. And the difference is that a sponsor is somebody that will represent you and put you forward for opportunities as they present themselves to them. That's very different than someone giving you counsel and advice for you to consider when you're contemplating what you should do next. Right. So I have personal mentors. I had, um, you know, the first woman that took care of my kids in her home had six kids and she had been through everything. And I considered her my mom mentor. Right. Anything that was wrong with my kids, I would call her up and I would listen to what she had to say because she just had such a great perspective having raised six successful kids. Yeah. I was just trying to do one, <laughs> you know, at the time, um, which was overwhelming. And then, you know, I have another mentor. Um, I don't think she's on the phone, but her name is Merle Holman, who I've met recently. And she's in her 80s. And she'd probably kill me for saying that she doesn't like people to know because she does not look like she's in her 80s. But, you know, she grew up in such a different time for me. When I get um, personally frustrated with how slow things may be advancing for women, Merle's the person I call because I want to have lunch with Merle. And I want her to remind me that she didn't even have maternity leave when she had her kids. <laughs> that her, her uh, boss actually told her she wasn't going to have a job if she decided to have a baby. So it's really important for me to put that, you know, I'm an older woman, but it's important for me to put that in perspective because we have really advanced significantly in Merle's mind. We have done a lot of advancement as a, as a society and within our organizations. So that is mentorship. That's not sponsorship. Sponsorship is what my current boss does for me, which is say, Colleen needs to be, you know, recently with COVID, we had a strategic committee that was formed called the Bring Back Committee. And my boss said, Colleen needs to be on that Bring Back Committee. That's a real life example of sponsorship, of somebody saying that you are the person that should be considered for different opportunities and then working with you to make sure that you're ready to take on those opportunities. Does that make sense? That totally makes sense. Is there... Um a specific way at SEI that, that you've maybe not a formal program per se, but how do you promote that behavior? Like what are some of the ways that you, is it just drawing awareness to it or are there certain um, exercises or certain things that you can do as a leader to help promote that more frequently in your environment? <laughs> So I think there's a couple of things. We, we have learned that it doesn't necessarily work to just get paired up with somebody. Right. Right. So that even if, if it's mentorship. So mentorship can be a great avenue to sponsorship. You can start as a mentor. But I the mistake I find that a lot of our newer employees make is that they they schedule time with somebody senior and they they just say, I want to pick your brain. And they just want to talk to them and get to know them, but they don't bring anything themselves to the table. So a lot of times when I'm coaching people about having meetings with different folks that you want to consider for your mentor or your sponsor, you need to bring to the table a gift for them. And that gift should be something that you're an expert in. And if you are a recent college grad, you're an expert in uh, social media that a lot of these um, people that you're seeking out to be your mentor are not experts in. So the gift you can bring to them to the table is your insight on those media or your insight on what college grads are looking for in their next job or your insight, like with your meeting with me, your insight onto what cool benefits we should be looking at as an organization as that generation takes over higher and higher percentages of our workforce. There are really a lot of things that everybody brings to the table. You just have to figure out what your gift is that you can bring and always make that a two-sided conversation. And then, you know, as a, as a woman leader and for some of the um, women that I've mentored, it's really, um, first of all, making sure that 
we all have our own unique leadership style. My leadership style, I tell people when they first start working for me, is that if you tell me you're okay, I will believe you. <laughs> so don't tell me you're okay if you're not okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so making sure that you know you can work with people when you can see that they may be in a little bit of trouble, because I do believe, I'm, first of all, I'm a huge fan of the millennials, and I'm sure I'll be a huge fan of the Zoomers. Um, and part of that is they just bring such a unique and fresh perspective to the workforce. But the mistake a lot of senior managers is makes is that they let them get bored. Well, I don't want to see anybody that works for me get bored. Sure. I really want to give them so much work until they tell me they can't take on any more work. Yeah. And that's always been my approach with the millennials or the future Zoomers is to make sure that they have lots of challenging work. You know, like I said, I didn't necessarily like being an accountant at the beginning of my career. But if I have to, I do accounting work now, right? I have to look at financial statements. I have to manage my own budget. And, and if that is you know, 10 or 15% of my job and 85% of my job is other stuff, that's great. So really making sure that you give um, your employees a good balance of stuff that's gonna challenge them and keep them interested while they may have to do some of the more main mundane things that they have to do. Yeah, definitely. And I think that, um, you know, this ties into my, my next question, I think, which is around delegation, right? And I think, you know, if you look at kind of the pathways that many senior leaders take, um, there has to be this transi transition from being the sole doer, right, to being able to get into more experiential management opportunities and management roles and, and being able to delegate and being able to lead. Um, what are some ways, you know, that that you've been able to help kind of coach and, and, and guide some of the female leaders uh, at your organization uh, to begin to understand the importance of this skill, but then also to start exercising it along the way too. So I, I think two things pop into my head when you talk about that, um, Tom, that, uh, that I want to talk about. The first is it's really important to be, as a leader, a really good talent scout. You know, your, your, my hires have not always been traditional. They have, I, I, um, I've never thought of HR as HR. I've always thought of sure. HR as sales, right? So when you think of HR as sales, when you think about, you know, there's always been the, I call it the chicken or the egg debate in sales. Is it better to hire a technologist and teach them how to sell or hire a salesperson and teach them the technology, right? Well, you're more open if you think about it that way to uh, potentially more diverse candidates and making sure that um, you provide them the opportunities to learn, but also that, you know, they present a different way of thinking than you and they make the team better when you look at them that way. So that talent scout ability is really, really important, especially as we move into the future when there is emerging, like I'm in the war for talent in HR, we all are, and everybody that's on the call that's in HR. Sure. It's really important that we um, be able to recognize that some people may be able to do some things that aren't in the market yet. And that's really uh, I think one of the key things for executives to have as they look forward. The other point is, you know, I found a happy medium with that because I do still like to be very technical. SEI is a, I mean, when you interview, when people interview our leaders at SEI, they're always surprised by how hands-on we all are. So I found a company that let me still be to some degree somewhat hands-on, which I like. I actually find it relaxing if I can be technical for a, a portion of my time. Um, not all the time, but a portion of my time. So I think you can find companies where even as a leader, you can still dab your toe into the technical piece of it. But if you are a good talent scout and you put really smart people into positions and you provide them with the tools that they need to do the job, you should be able to trust them to be able to do that job for you. Sure. And I think another important skill that's very underestimated is the ability to project manage. And if you are a college grad coming into the workforce and you have a strong project management skills, you're going to do incredible at SEI because you're going to be able to manage these senior leaders that, you know, things slip off their plate in importance. But if you're a good project manager, you know how to make that important for them. And you can look really good very quickly because you can get a project accomplished because you know how to make it important to the people that you need to help you with that. Yeah. Um, one thing that I've uh, read and, and kind of, you know, seen a lot of statistics to back this up is uh, women are challenged when it comes to negotiating, uh, negotiating new opportunities, negotiating pay. Um, you know, there's definitely statistics. Uh, I believe you shared some statistics too around, you know, confidence level, right? And I'm just kind of want to dive into from a leadership perspective, what are some ways that you've been able to 
help coach, help train, um, help bring light to the importance of negotiation as a skill. Uh, and then also, if you have any tips for anybody who's listening, who's also struggled with that, because uh, I, I know that that's such a huge challenge. And I'd imagine it's even more of a challenge if you have a, a male leader or a male supervisor that, that you need to uh, engage in that conversation with. Sure. And the statistic, Tom, that you're referring to is uh, one that I think came out of the Lean In book, which basically said that a man needs to feel 40 percent qualified to apply for a job, but a female needs to feel 80 percent. And most of the women on the call, and myself included, will validate that at some point. So sure. yes, you're right. I, I need to feel, some of us need to feel 150% qualified to even apply for that. Um, one of the things that we've been, uh, so we've been very happy with Phenom. I'm going to put, give you guys a little plug there with, uh, with our uh, internal mobility. And one of the things that we've been happy with is that we've been able to turn off the percentage fit for a role because our hypothesis was that that may work against women. If they didn't see that they were 100% of a fit for a position, we still wanted them to see the positions and not what fit that they were. So that is one of the things that uh, we launched our internal mobility platform in January. We're still working through that. Um, we have more than half of our employees on it. Um, so we'll know more as we get to the end of the year, but we believe that that'll help give uh, women the confidence to apply for more. It's also key in this position, and I'll share with you a personal example, that you tap into your mentors and your friends. Sure. I had a very good friend of mine, a work friend, call call me on it one time because I was saying that I didn't think I was qualified to do something. And she right got in, in my face about it and said, the other person you're talking about is less qualified than you. You can do this. Make sure you do it. So we at one point had a, a SEI Women's um, Summit that the part of the books that we sponsored was I Dare Me. And I think it's really important to um, support each other and to encourage women to apply for things. And when you see them hesitant, call them on it and let them know that they shouldn't be hesitant in that area and reinforce why they should feel confident applying for that. Um, yeah, I, I love that you did that with the FIT score. So I'll, you know, back up and say that as a product marketer for Phenom, <laughs> you know, in, in my natural inclination is to promote the value of the AI FIT score, right? Because it's one of our key features uh, from the product perspective, from the technology perspective. But I think that's, in, in your choice to remove it, um, what you've done is you've elevated the conversation, right? Uh, as it pertains to how technology has positive impacts on the way that we hire uh, internally and externally and how it could potentially have averse impacts, right? And I think the most important thing is uh, for any organization to go in eyes wide open and understand the impact that something like that can have, both po both positive and negative, and have those conversations, and then look at the data too. So I love that uh, you had such a unique hypothesis. You know, we have so many customers. This is the first time I've really heard that hypothesis and and heard that action being taken for that reason. Um, and I'm just super impressed. Uh, you know, not to um, toot your horn, Colleen, but like, I'm just super impressed at that level of thinking. And I think that the, it's an opportunity to encourage um, that level of thinking at other organizations too, right? Because it 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 can have that effect, right? And I think that it's, it's incredibly important uh, as we look at not just the AI fit score, but other ways that technology um, may or may not uh, open doors or close doors, right? And I think that it's super critical uh, that we continue to have those conversations. So thank you uh, for taking it to that level and bringing it, bringing it to the show. Um, so I'm kind of curious, uh, you know, that's one area where you kind of saw technology or you saw data and you decided to make a decision like that. Are there any other areas where like you've been looking at the data and you decided to change course on a program or like, hey, we really need to introduce this new element to it because I'm looking at this data over here and it's telling me uh, that my hypothesis was off or I need to uh, change direction. So I'll, I'm going to get not in the recruiting space. Let me get more to the retention space because we talked sure. a little bit about recruiting already. Um, so one of the inflection points that we saw our data showing us some different points was going from the manager level to the director level. And we saw a 10% drop off on the percentage of females going from manager to director. And we also saw an increase in turnover. And so we wanted to, to probe on that a little bit to say like, why are, why are female managers falling off of the path? 
at the director level. And there was a lot of reasons that people gave us um, for that. But to me, one of the things that could be a positive outside of COVID with the relooking at the workforce and letting more people move into hybrid and remote working is that uh, a lot of the women said they didn't, that we interviewed, especially in our UK office, said that they didn't feel like they wanted the time obligation that they would need in order to move to the director level. And we now that we have a more flexible work week are giving some of our women back somewhere between five and 10 hours a week in commute time. And so I'm hopeful that that may encourage more of our managers and frankly supervisors, although we don't have a supervisor level in the UK, but we do in the US, um, really encourage some of those supervisors and managers to apply for those director level positions because we definitely see a drop off. Um, at, when they get to that level. And and then we also see, uh, it's funny, our tenure of our women is a, is almost a year greater, our average tenure of females is almost a year greater than the average tenure of men. And uh, they're, they're all over six years. So I think it's like 6.73 and I may have this wrong. So if anybody from my team's on there and I get it wrong, sorry, but the other one's like over seven for females. And so we know that if, if women stay here, they tend to be what some of our leaders call stickier. They tend to want to stay around longer. And so getting them to the director level is important for us. Also, the director level is a feeder pool for the executive level in the organization. So it's a particular area that the data told us that we should focus on and continue to focus on. Um, I love that you also pointed out, you know, one of the positives from the pandemic. So, I, you know, obviously over the past 18 months or so, there's been a lot of emphasis on on the challenges and a lot of the negative aspects. And I don't want to downplay any of those. Um, if you are a working or single mother, it was incredibly challenging, I'd imagine, and continues to be challenging. But it, it's nice to shine the light on some of those areas of opportunity to look, to look for uh, without commuting. You have that extra time. And because your data and because your um your panel informed you that this was one of the things holding women back from progressing in their career, or at least pursuing that progression. You're able to open that up, uh, which is really awesome. Um, I'm curious, uh, one of the other challenges uh, that we hear about hiring for diversity and promoting for diversity is if you're a super localized company, um, if, if you're not global, if you're not open to remote workers, um, you are very much limited by the the makeup of your geography, right? Uh, so that you might have these really ambitious diversity hiring goals, but if you're not hiring outside of a geographic area that can support those goals, you'll likely never hit those, right? So one of the other positives that I've seen from the, the pandemic is as companies have been expanding to remote work, they've been able to really break the barriers that those geographic pools have been limited to. Um, is that something that you're exploring or doing at SEI? Um, it, have you been able to source talent uh, from outside of geographic areas as a result of the pandemic? Or is that something you've always been doing? We have absolutely seen that, Tom. Um, so even the SEI people on the call will be surprised to hear this because we would publish this in this year's numbers, not last year's numbers. So we haven't really talked about it. But you know, the um, addition of the Phenom portal has 10 times our candidate pool. So prior to implementing our portal through Phenom, we had about 3,000 candidates a year applying for our position. We're at over 30,000 now, right? So that's a wow. huge jump, which helps us tremendously. Um, and the in, as I mentioned, the internal portal, we used to have about two to 300 employees looking at internal opportunities. We're now at over 2,000. So we're incredibly happy with both of those numbers. Part of it is that we're not geographically limited, but also a big piece of that is being able to run campaigns and increase the candidate flow through the portal itself. I'm also very impressed with the amount of diversity that we've had, especially in our more senior level positions that we've been recruiting for. And so I don't have a number to report on that yet, but I can tell you that anecdotally, it's significantly improved over where we were, let's say five years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um I have a bit of a curveball question. Uh, so, obviously, if if you're um, a woman professional at SEI, you're working for an amazing company that's progressive and and also very proactive, right? But let's say you're tuning into the show, and you're not working for SEI. You're working for a company that doesn't have these initiatives. Uh, you're working for a company where you've really struggled to. Uh, progress your career, you really struggle to have your voice heard, um, can't find the mentor, can't find the sponsor within the organization. 
Um, do you have any advice or any tips for, for that individual who might be listening today? Um, we are at such an interesting juncture with, you know, this post pandemic life and uh, hiring, you know, companies moving to remote work, like is now the, the time, you know, that you would encourage that individual to look elsewhere or look for, for remote work or try to be the spark to start initiating some of these programs at that organization. I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, outside looking in, this is outside of SEI. What would you say to an individual like that? So can I answer all of the above? Yeah, <laughs> so, yes, I, so here's can. one thing yeah. that we've always found. You don't necessarily have to find your voice initially at work. You sure. can look outside of work. You can look at volunteer opportunities. You can look within your community. And I would say start there to find your voice. Let that help you build your confidence. And if you're so inclined, be the, be the person to start things. I mean, our SEI Women's Network is, is something that we're all really proud of at the organization. And I believe it's close to 20 years old, but you know, it, it really has a new life every five years. And that's fantastic. Um, if, if you don't have something like that, see if you can be the person to start it within your organization. I referenced the war for talent. I mean, the job market is hotter now than I think I've ever seen it in my professional career. I encourage, I have an article that I wrote um, that you can read if you go into my LinkedIn profile, but I encourage people that work for me to regularly interview externally. I think that's really important. I think it's first of all important to know your worth. It's an incredibly humbling experience and I never want to forget how humbling it is to look for a job. So I think it's important that you do that. You also get intelligence on what other people are doing that's out there and you get the confidence to speak about yourself and your accomplishments and the things that you've done. So. I'm never adverse to encouraging people to interview. If you don't want to leave your company, I would say give your company a chance before you get to final round interview. That sure. would be the time to, you know, talk to your boss about, you know, why you initially took the call or why you considered looking externally. Yeah, Th there's a great, um, there's a great comment here in the chat. Uh, <laughs> fix each other's crowns, not knock them off. And I, I just, that's a great sentiment. I really love that. Um, and uh, Jen here uh, had also said, I love how uh, you truly customize that experience for your women employees, um, uh, talking about some of the programs that you've implemented. So uh, again, if you have any questions for Colleen, uh, feel free to sound them off in the chat as we start to kind of wrap up this conversation. Uh, but Colleen, I love that advice that you gave, uh, you know, to anybody who's trying to really develop that, that voice, um, you know, maybe start externally and bring that spark to your company. Um, are there any great, books, podcasts, thought leaders, anything that you've picked up uh, along your career that has left a mark with you or anything that you've kind of passed on to other professionals uh, within your organization or outside that you'd recommend? Um, I love the Lean In and Plan B book. It, okay. they, both of those have influenced me greatly. So I, you know, if you haven't read those, I think that they're fantastic books for anybody to read. I love Good to Great. Uh, we use Gallup strengths at SEI. I love all of the strengths books. Um, I think that you, you know, you, we've, we've found a real niche internally where we've been able to utilize our strengths to have deeper conversations and to promote people within the organization. So I, I'm a big fan of all of that. Although I don't, you know, I say all the time, I don't want to get too hung up on one particular tool. It's, you know, more of the methodology and the approach that's important less so the tool, but if you can find something that can help start a conversation, a lot of times if you use a third party to start a conversation like the strengths exercise, it puts it in a more neutral, less personal territory, and it makes it a little bit easier for you to have those conversations. Yeah, and those known frameworks, those kind of proven frameworks uh, can also help you bring that to your organization if your organization doesn't have them, right? So that, that could definitely be an easy way to kind of start the spark, right, of having better conversations uh, about um, personality profiles and strengths and all those different things. Um, as we wrap up, I uh, just wanted to ask you if you had any final thoughts, um, any, any final words that you wanted to share before we uh, close out today's episode. No, just that I'm incredibly honored again to speak on today, to speak on a day like today. So thank you, everybody, for inviting me. I appreciate it. Definitely. Uh, we are so happy to have you and I absolutely mean it. We really want to have you back uh, after you run some of these additional programs because I'd love to hear some of the stories that that come out of those um, and, and some of the uh, successes that you're able to help uh, generate over at SEI. So thanks again, Colleen. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I really do mean this. I'm just in admiration of a lot of the uh, 
introspective and really sophisticated questions that you've been asking about your organization and the way that you've been looking at data and using that data to really generate some of these programs. Uh, and again, as a father of two daughters, you know, I look to, to professional leaders like you uh, and professional leaders like you in the space um, so that I can help guide as well, right? And continue to open doors. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to all those uh, who joined in on the chat. Uh, Karen, Caitlin, Pamela, really appreciate it. Thank you for uh, tuning in today. And uh, Colleen, uh, we hope to see you on a future episode. Thanks again. See you soon. See ya. Well, there you have it. Uh, hopefully you were able to stick around for the whole episode. If you joined late uh, and you want to catch the episode uh, replay, head on over to phenom.com. Check out our blog. In about a week, uh, we'll have the full episode up there. Uh, and we will have all of the highlights. Uh, so what we like to do is uh, we'll pull out some of the clips so you can check out some of the main highlights from today's episode. Uh, we have everybody sounding off in the chat, just thanking Colleen for all these great insights. As I mentioned um, at the top of the show, uh, today's Women's Equality Day, which again, we did not plan that whatsoever. So today's episode was breaking barriers, empowering the next generation of women uh, leaders, and uh, you couldn't have planned a better day to do it. So as I mentioned, my name's Tom Tate. I'm filling in for Devin Foster. He may or may not be back next week. I'm not quite sure, but tune in every single Thursday, 12 p.m. Eastern time. We go live on LinkedIn. We go live on Facebook. Uh, I think we're still live on Periscope, which is Twitter, uh, and we go live on uh, YouTube. So you can tune in on your platform of choice. I like to say this is the greatest show on the internet. So if you want to tune into the greatest show on the internet, uh, be sure to come back for Talent Experience Live. Uh, as Jen mentions, uh, phenom.com slash blog. You can check out our archive of uh, a lot of the amazing episodes uh, that have been produced to date. There's over 52 episodes. We've done over 52 episodes of this show, uh, which is hard to believe. Uh, but again, thank you so much uh, to our audience today. Uh, very active chat. Um, it's great to have you chime in uh, and really uh, uh, deliver some of your insights as well. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, we'll sign off for today and uh, hopefully we'll see you next week at 12 p.m. Eastern.